Father, I give you great thanks and praise for your glory, your love for us, your goodness. I thank you that you are our God, that you are the Creator God. Help us, Lord, to understand the mystery of prayer and what it is and why it's important. In our prayer, help us to not only know you, but hear you and listen to you, and most importantly, to follow where you lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here's the question. What, what is prayer? Conversation with God. What else? Is a plea for help? What else? It's also a chance to say thank that we're asked to do. I'm assuming God, is, you're saying God is asking us yeah. to do? Okay. When do you tend to pray? I don't mean necessarily time of day, but anytime. So when... Now, by any, by any time, do you mean that you pray anytime? You, you, when you pray, you pray anytime? Okay, okay. Doesn't matter where I am, what I'm doing. All right. Brother Lawrence would say continually. Continually. Let your life be a prayer. Mm. Oh. When I worry. Any other times? When I'm thankful, we have some heavy children. It's probably the same one. Exclamation point. <laughs> Exclamation points. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, let's see, what else? 
how to do it seems like a straightforward question until you start considering this stuff. How do you pray continually? How do you, how do you let your life be prayer? <laughs> That's one way. Continually, I have a formal prayer period, but then during the day, I don't have brief conversations. Sort of shoot some. <laughs> yeah. You know, something yeah. Nice happens. Mm -hmm. I think we all fall short of the ideal set by Brother Lawrence. Oh, of course. Yeah, I, I certainly do. But the idea is, uh, is there that uh, finding something uh, good. And all that is around you is a, is a way of connecting with God, which is a way of praying. Mm. Mm. I know through in almost everything, some, a lot of things throughout the day, I'll try and ask God, am I doing the right thing for you? Yeah. And, and try and make sure that I'm staying focused on that. So focusing towards God, I think is, is my way that I try and be continual. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul uh, in Romans says that the Spirit is praying for us, he uses the phrase interceding us, in interceding for us with sighs too deep for words. And I, when I think about the, the when, I, I, I'm like a lot of you. I mean, your answers are my answers. The only thing I would add to it is over the years, I've come to trust, and it's really an act of trust, that Scripture means that, that, that the Holy Spirit is praying even when I'm not consciously praying. And in that sense, as a spirit-filled person, I am continually praying because the spirit in me is praying, and that's something I just take on faith. Uh, I just—that's uh, one. That's certainly one place where the Bible says it, and I believe it for sure. Um, and we'll get into the hows as we go along. So this is good. Um, this may be all kind of introductory stuff for a lot of you then. All right, I'm gonna have to move this around here a little bit. But I don't need that plugged in. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, in Luke chapter 11, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And you know, I got to ask myself, of all the questions that I could have asked the Lord, I don't know if that was, would have been one of them. I, I might have asked, teach me to heal people, or teach me to raise the dead, or teach me to do miracles. But when I think about it, uh, I think, well, maybe the reason they asked that question was that they saw that those things were the result of Jesus' prayer life. They saw that it was key to his life. Now, when it comes to the, the when of prayer or the how of prayer, or even the why, there are some things that uh, shall we say, I'm not going to call anything wrong per se, but not necessarily uh, effective. Um, there's the magic wand approach to prayer, where we sort of wave it uh, at God. Um, and and you, can, you can think uh, wrongly that, that prayer is a formula. This is easy for Episcopalians to do because we pray in collects. It's not collect. It's collect, because it's Old English. Uh, and a collect is a type of prayer, 
and it follows a formula. It begins with an ascription, O Lord, something like that. And then it, it has a, uh, it, it usually will say something about God's uh, nature. The one I point, the easiest one to point to would be the collect for purity, Almighty God. There's the ascription, and then there's a uh, uh, an acclamation of His character and nature. To you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. And then the petition: cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And then then there's a doxology, uh, usually in the form of the Trinity, but not always in the form of the Trinity. So that's a collect, and that's a type of prayer, but it's not a magic formula. Uh, it's just a type of prayer. So the magic wand approach isn't uh, necessarily a good one. Uh, certainly praying the collect is a great way to pray. And, and uh, one re you know, why are they called collects? Because they collect the prayers of the people. They, they collect our prayers and sum them up. And uh, if you ever, you know, you, you know you can get the prayer book as an app. For those of you with smartphones, you can get, them, get the prayer book as an app. It's like 99 cents. And uh, you could just read through the collects. And if you read through the collects, you're like, wow, there isn't a whole lot that's not touched on in those prayers. Uh, another uh, would be um, you were talking about praying when you like you really like need help, um, and that's fine. We all do that, but if you only pray as like treat prayer like a first aid kit, use only an emergency. <laughs> uh, that's not helpful. Um, yeah, I don't want to treat it as a as a last resort. There's a, uh, this is an apocryphal story, but a, you know, a, at a vestry meeting, some vestry member says to everyone, well, I guess we're just going to have to pray about it. And the priest says, has it come to that? <laughs> <clears throat> so we don't want to treat it as a first aid kit. And we, it, it's not a tug of war. It's not like a religious game where we're trying to get God to, to do something for us that he wouldn't do unless we were praying. Um, and it's not about pestering God, although Jesus uses some images of pestering God. He was trying to say, well, I re erased it, pray continually. You don't stop. Just keep praying. Uh, and it's not a religious duty. Um, there the basic motivation might be guilt. So w what then is it? In addition to everything that we've said, uh, one way to think about prayer is prayer is an act of dedication. Um. Yeah. Well, I've been to seminary and I have, graduate, I have a graduate education, <laughs> but I can't spell. Um, our uh, prayer should express, at, at least elements of our prayer should express our devotion and our dependence on God. When we, when we pray, we're saying, I need you, God. Now, immediately we have a problem because, or at least some of us have a problem, because I don't always feel dependent on God. I feel quite capable of doing some things myself. And then it blows up. But you'd think I learn, but uh, I can go right back into the habit of thinking I can do it myself. And thinking that way is a significant barrier to effective prayer. Um, not a, if you don't admit you need help, prayer is going to be a problem. And in that sense, prayer is costly. It costs us humi humility. I'm inadequate. If I pray, it means I'm inadequate. Uh, I'm not self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency is an enemy of prayer, I would say. Now, John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Some branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Remaining in Jesus, of course, is actually more than prayer, but prayer is a big part of it. I think it's also reading scripture. And by the way, reading scripture can be an act of prayer. Uh, and let me just say something about that for a moment. Bible study is important, but so is just reading it. Uh, how many of you have heard of Day by Day? The, the, the prayer series Day by Day. Um, I don't know if it's online or not. Um, we may have copies. Where are they kept? In the back of the church, on the table in the back of the church. So day, uh, the day by day, is a, it's in three months, right? It has three month sections. It's just a book of uh, meditations, one page meditations and scripture passages to read. And if you do something like day by day, or if you pray through the daily lectionary in the Book of Common Prayer, in those moments when you're reading the Bible, I would be re just reading it. And what I suggest is a way of praying through the Bible is you read a, you're reading a passage and ask yourself what sort of sticks out and leaps out at you, and then go back and read it several times, just that passage, maybe one or two verses. And each time you read it, emphasize a different word. And that can be a, a, a very prayerful and enlightening way of hearing what God's up to. Um, I, you know, I do this at the 8 a.m. service during the Agnes Day. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world. I don't always say it verbally, but in my mind I'm emphasizing a different word. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world. Um, and that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's a way of praying uh, through the Bible. You're letting it soak in. Prayer is also, of course, communication. Two-way. We, we usually think of it this way. Okay? Uh, and when we think about how we pray, and we'll, later we're going to do a session on discerning God's voice, but how, it's one thing to pray, it's another thing to listen. Uh, perhaps another thing entirely uh, to listen. And here's the thing about, about uh, communication. Uh, we really, obviously we, we live in a much, much different world than the first century. But uh, how many of you seen the movie Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis? I love that movie. And one of the things about it that just shocked me was this, this scene where he's in the White House and you know these people come to talk to him and the, the door opens briefly and there's this whole plethora of people waiting to talk to the president. And I, I, I'm, I mean, obviously that doesn't happen anymore. You can't even get to the White House, let alone into the office, uh, to talk to the president. And in the ancient world, I mean, from the ancient world, I mean, all the way through the Renaissance and, um, you know, in every place there's been a monarchy or... Uh, a rule of authority in Jesus day if you were an average person you had zero hope of ever talking to Caesar the best you could hope for was that you might know someone who knows someone who knows or you know in in Europe in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance and whatnot um, your, your best you could hope for is if you knew someone who might know someone who's in the royal court and then you could say, could you have them put in a good word for me? But what does the writer of Hebrews say? Uh, the writer of Hebrews 
tells us in uh, 4.16, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Let us come boldly to the throne. If that, don't let that get lost on you. So when I'm talking about communication, I'm, I'm not talking just about what prayer is. What I'm trying to say is, do you understand the privilege that we have of being able to go boldly into the throne room of our God and not have to go through an intermediary? You know, we don't have to know someone who knows someone. We can go right to him. People can have a hard time praying because they, they don't see that. They don't see what a privilege it is to talk to God. I mean, what would you do if you were told, uh, you've been invited to talk to the president, and it's tomorrow morning at 7.45 a.m. First thing, you probably wouldn't sleep a wink. You know, there are all kinds of things that you might do. Well, a greater invitation has been given to us. You've been invited to converse with the Almighty, the Creator God. Another difficulty is that some people don't believe that God is interested in them or that he cares all that much about what goes on in their life, their, you know, our car payment and our mortgage and you know, kids in school and clothing and bills and everything else that we worry about and have to deal with. We think God, you know, what, you know, God's got bigger fish to fry than to deal with my little old problems. I hear that a lot. And that completely misunderstands uh, the relationship that God wants to have uh, with us. I mean, uh, when you're married, uh, hopefully a, health, a healthy marriage, uh, your spouse is not unconcerned about any of those things. And the Bible tells us that, that marriage is the on-earth institution, uh, the on-earth model, if you will, of the relationship that God wants to have with us. So I think that the communication part is partly a love problem. How can someone who doubts God's love really have a really communicate with him? If you doubt God's love, how do you begin to get through that? Well, guess what? It's by praying. <laughs> And that sounds a little, little bit like a catch-22, but the more you pray, the more you're going to realize that God loves you. You keep at it, and you'll, you will, you'll learn that God loves you dearly. And what do you have to lose anyway? You have nothing to lose. Prayer is an act of supplication. That is, a, it's a request. So it, it does include uh, our, our requests. Paul in Philippians Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 Don't be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God. John, uh, Jesus in John 16, uh, verse 23, tells us this. Truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So prayer is the way we make our requests known to God. It's God's method of meeting our needs. I used to think, well, God knows everything. He knows my need. Why do I have to pray it? And I, I think that's a good question. And I think the answer is that, first of all, God does know what, everything you need. He already knows. But we go back to communication. And we have to realize that, uh, and I think I've said this in other ways in other sermons, I think that God has created, God, well, first of all, God has created the physical universe to operate in a certain way. And it has to, or we wouldn't be here. 
there, there has to be order uh, to the physical world in the universe or matter doesn't coalesce. Gravity, if there's no gravity, nothing can come together. Blah, 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 you know, nothing happens. So there's, there's order uh, in the universe. And the spiritual world, or heaven, if you will, I think is, is a similar kind of thing, although it's more mysterious. There are some truths about this spiritual reality, and one of them is that prayer is a way, in, is one of the ways in which, to borrow N.T. Wright's language, the way heaven and earth overlap and intersect and interlock that heaven is not far away. Uh, heaven is uh, actually, you know, all around us. It's quite near, but it's separate. But there are places and times when it overlaps and it intersects, and prayer is one of those. I don't know if it's a question of whether or not we are causing prayer, uh, causing heaven and earth to intersect, or whether prayer puts us in an intersection <laughs> that's already there. You know, I, I think that's an interesting way of thinking about it. Uh, C.H. Spurgeon, the 19th century British Baptist preacher, said, God never shuts his storehouses until you shut your mouth. <laughs> so what are you lacking because you haven't asked? And you might be, well, I, you know, the things I've been wanting to ask for, I'm not sure it's right to ask. Well, what's wrong with asking it? I mean, if we're growing in our relationship with God, probably your, the things you're going to ask for will evolve over time. But for, for someone, you know, no matter where you are in your spiritual life with God, if you, wanna, if you really, really, really desire to win the lottery, you could ask God to, you know, to win the lottery. It's not wrong. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's, it's, not, it's not wrong, okay? So don't look at what we should be pray, praying about in terms of right or wrong. But as we grow in our relationship with God, our character and the things that we desire um, are probably going to change as we, as we mature. And the point is that in our relationship with God, our desires begin to mesh with his desires. I think God is, God is interested in genuine communication, not fake communication. That's really my point. Uh, Psalm 145, uh, verse 19, He grants the desires of those who reverence him. Psalm 37, 4, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And the key to understanding passages like that is the reverence him part and the delight in the Lord part. In other words, when you delight in the Lord, you're not just delighting in him, you're delighting in his ways, you're delighting in his will, you're, de you're delighting in his law, to put it in first century term, or um, excuse me, Old Testament terms. Uh, delighting in his word and his commandments, and that's what you want. When you're reverencing the Lord, it's the same kind of thing. So if you're delighting in God, you're trusting, uh, you're trying the best as you know how to let God's spirit live in your, live in your life and rule your life, then your desires are not going to be wrong. Uh, Rick Warren, people remember Rick Warren, okay, wrote The Purpose Driven Life. He tells this story. He says it's true. So I'm going to take him at his word. Rick Warren tells a story of a high school student who had just become a Christian, and he was learning all kinds of new words like omnipresent and omnipotent and omniscient, which is, you know, he's everywhere, he's all-powerful, and he's all-knowing. So the student was about to start studying one day, and he was thinking about all this. And he says, God, you know everything that's going to happen in the future. That means you know what's going to be on the algebra final <laughs> before the teacher even writes it. So I pray that you will help me and guide my studying, that I will study the right things. And then he also prayed, you said to ask for anything, so I'm going to be specific. 
I'm going to pray for an 87 on the test. I guess he didn't have faith for an A. He took the test, and when he got the test back, the graded test, he got an 86. And he's, oh, I'm so disappointed, Lord. You just, you let me down. I'd have been pretty happy myself. But <laughs> the next day, the teacher said to the class, I made mistakes on five papers. I need those papers back, those tests back. And he got an 87. Yeah. <laughs> now, I think the point is that God's intensely interested in every factor of your life. Uh, your real life. So dedication, communication, supplication, and uh, last one. Cooperation. Uh, this is kind of the exciting stuff. We are in prayer. We get to cooperate with what God is up to uh, in the world. It's uh, prayer is God's program of bringing his will uh, to bear on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I've got to keep this out here. This is my Bible. John 14. This is kind of amazing stuff here. John 14, verses 11 to 14. Jesus said, believe in me, excuse me, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I have to admit, that's a pretty amazing passage. Um, it's hard for me to believe that I can do greater things than Jesus. Until I start connecting that, pat, that verse with verse 13. The greater things than these, and then he says, but I, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Prayer is the way it works. Prayer is how we do greater things than even Jesus did. And how is that possible? Well, it's because prayer is not limited. Prayer is not limited by time or space. I mean, people can reject uh, your appeals, your arguments. That you can, they can even reject you as a pers person, but they're defenseless against your prayers. D.L. Moody, another uh, great preacher, once said, every great movement of God can be traced to a single praying, kneeling figure. I mean, think about it. I mean, think about uh, some of the things that have happened in our, in our world, uh, in, and even in the, just the Christian world, that started because, you know, Martin Luther spent four hours a day in prayer or name, name some other saint. I want Christ Church to be a praying church. Uh, I think it makes us sensitive to God and to other people. And prayer, it builds enthusiasm. It's exciting stuff. I've I think I've told you before, I think I've told you in this class about my, my experience with prayer in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it was the most life-changing thing I, I've ever been a part of. Uh, to see God um, show me what's going to happen in my mind and then makes, making it happen, right? And it unfolds right in front of me was uh, incredible. And I think as, I, as I've told that story before, I wish I could say that I came back from that and just prayed like that all the time. Uh, it's tough. So looking ahead, we're going to be looking at uh, next time is how, or ha how to have a rewarding prayer life. We're going to look at how God answers prayer. We're going to look about the relationship between prayer and God's will. And then our last session is going to be uh, discerning God's voice. But we have a few minutes. Are there any, any thoughts or questions? Yeah. How should we 
react when you pray continually for something and it doesn't happen? Well, depending on what it is, uh, I mean, I can think of a situation in my life where uh, as a family member that I, I'm praying for, but I, I'm not seeing any I'm not seeing any results. And I'm just, as long as I have breath, I'm going to continue to pray. That, depending on what it is, I mean, there, there uh, can be other situations where uh, I, I can't think of a specific example, but if I were, if I were praying for you know, some ministry in Christ Church to get off the ground and it con continually flounders, I might say, okay, Lord, you're trying to tell me something. <laughs> uh, maybe I should be praying for something else. It, it's a tough one. I, I think it, it takes discernment. And uh, I think it's also where the body of Christ comes in. If our prayer is constantly in isolation from other Christians that we trust, then we don't really have any way of gauging some, the answers to those kinds of things, of asking someone else. You know, I've been, I've been praying for this for however long, and that your friend may say, well, you know, I think you need to keep praying. Or your friend may say, you know, I, maybe, maybe it's time to stop. And God will speak to us through people like that. So I, can, I think it can go either way. It depends on what we're, what we're talking about. God's will be done. God's will will be done, yeah. What else? All right. Yep, all right. one more. Can we have the tables back? <laughs> we, we will. There's a reason they're not here today. There's a reason because there's this... She's not here. She's not here. <laughs> there's the big shing ding going on tonight. tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's why. <laughs> Yep, that's the only reason. So sorry about that. Yeah, they, they all got taken for the reception tonight, for the, for the retirement party tonight. All right, see you next week. In the Wall Street Journal this week.